Follow that, kids. Can't. With the Ultimate Warrior. Yeah, the story of the Ultimate Warrior on A and E, as told by people who may have never met him, as far as I can tell. You know what's funny about this is I got uh, about ten billion emails on uh, Sunday night after the show, and uh, normally all of the emails say the same thing: people either like it or they don't like it. Mm-hmm. This time, I had half the people say, "Holy smokes, that wasn't bad at all. That was actually pretty good." And then the other people, the other half said, that was horrible. Nothing but lies. Which actually, from watching, I'm not sure where they talked about nothing but lies. But uh, yeah, it was very split what people thought of this Ultimate Warrior documentary. But for whatever reason, everybody wanted us to review it here on the show. So I guess we're going to well, review it here on the show. He was, in fact, a complicated, polarizing man. Well, so I guess he, that's fitting. He definitely was. I was like Shaft. He is nothing like Shaft. Shaft? Yeah, he's a complicated man, but nobody loves him like his woman. God damn, you're right. He's like Shaft. No, he's not like Shaft, but I mean, that line is like the warrior. But no, he is not like Shaft. Uh, He was not a black private dick who's a sex machine for all the chicks. That's true. Anyway, that's how the song goes. It won an Oscar. (laughs) A&E biography, Ultimate Warrior. (laughs) You broke Craig's internet on top of everything else. God (laughs) damn it. So young Jim Helwig... Grows up, the oldest of five children. It's him and his mom. And uh, at some point in his youth, his father left the family. Here they said 10. Later they said 12 or 13. All right, I got to start right here. (laughs) Okay, listen. It's going to be a long night. No, it's not. One of the big complaints about this show was that they had like 95 different journalists on the show. Yes. It's like it was all media people on this particular show. And then the only people that weren't media was like they had a couple comments from Vince they had his wife and his daughters, and they had his mother briefly. High school coach, a couple of oh, friends. Oh, yeah, the high school coach, and Jimmy Hart was there. Yeah. But then it was like media person, media person, media person, media person, media person, media person. Somebody was like, oh, you won't mind it too much. There's not a lot of Rosenberg. What show was that guy watching? There was Tons a ton of Rosenberg. Of Rosenberg. Rosenberg and and the other Sam guy, Sam Roberts. Sam Roberts. Why and is listen, he on things? Uh, well, you know, he's got to talk about the psychology of of human behavior. That's Sam Roberts' role here on this show. Hmm. But it wasn't like I minded the media people because you know they all talked about stuff that happened and they all did have some insight. But my issue, like with everyone, is like they tell us at the beginning that he was the oldest of five children, right? Yes. Where the hell's everybody else in his family? That's Don't fair. Know. None of his other family members had anything to say about Jim Helwig. They How about you have. talk more to his mother, or you talk more to his wife, or you talk more to Vince McMahon, or you talk more to Hulk Hogan, who was his main rival and one of the, the key individuals in his wrestling career. I mean, you know, another thing people were talking about was like they mentioned nothing about his WCW run. It's not even mentioned that he's in no. ever in World Championship Wrestling. And... There's not much to talk about. He showed up. It was horrible. And so they paid him to stay at home and not come back, which is basically what happened. But, I mean, you know he could have told a little of that story if you weren't talking to 85 different people that never maybe once talked to the Ultimate Warrior. So it was the same thing in all of the other episodes. Just too much reliance on random talking heads when I feel that there would have been more important talking heads. And that's certainly nothing against the talking heads. Dave was on there for crying out loud. Scott Yeager's a friend of mine. had been on his show a million times. He was great. But, like, let's get some people. Let's get some contemporaries of the Ultimate Warrior that were in this business. Fuck! They talked to fucking Vince Russo, who's telling us what the Warrior was thinking during a period that Vince Russo was running a fucking video store. He wasn't even in the business at the time. Yeah. I'm like, what the fuck is this guy doing on this show? At least have him talk about, I don't know. I don't even know what he would talk about. I have no idea. And to be fair, I kind of had the same thought about Paul Heyman. I don't know when Paul Heyman ever would have run into the Ultimate Warrior even one time. But he's Paul Heyman, so I don't care. He's always entertaining. And well, like I said, what Paul Heyman said made a lot of sense. Paul says, yes. well... You know, Warrior was going to be replacing Hulk Hogan. He was going to take over his role as the centerpiece of the company. How could Hulk Hogan not be upset about that? Which is obviously, obviously it's a valid point. So I didn't mind him. And like, as I said, some of the other talking heads had valid points. But where's the rest of the Warrior's family? Can I hear more from his mother? 
Can I hear more from his wife? That's my problem. Well, we had to talk to his football coach, Gary Pate. Apparently still coaching in, at uh, uh, Indiana. And they met Jim Helwig at football practice in 1975. Got him into weightlifting and then into bodybuilding, which is what he really loved to do. Moved to Georgia to do more bodybuilding. The other problem with this story, uh, there's a bunch of them, but so Warrior was married twice. His first wife was named Sherry. His second wife was named Dana. And if you're not paying very, very close attention to this show, because it doesn't go in linear time, it can be very hard to keep track of which wife they're talking about at any given point. But he meets his wife, Sherry. He wins the Mr. Georgia Bodybuilding Championship in 1984. We have shots of his daughter, Madigan Warrior. Getting into boxing and some kickboxing. And Warrior is talking about a time he had a guidance counselor tell him to give up on his dreams and go work at the factory in town. That, of course, did not happen. They had, they had some comments from his, uh, his daughter, the one that's into boxing, and she's basically saying, never say never to pro wrestling. I was like, oh, man. I cannot think of a conversation I'd like to have less with Paisley or Hanalei mm. than I'm thinking of getting into professional wrestling. So there was that. We have lots of ne- lots and lots of 1980s bodybuilding clips as I have to listen to Peter Rosenberg and Sam Roberts explain to me who Arnold Schwarzenegger of all is people. and why he's so popular. Dude, it is it is I think that uh Pumping Iron, very famous movie. And I think the movie is is significantly more influential than anyone gives it credit for being because like every bodybuilder in the 80s and 90s, they all talk about the same movie. And if you look at, especially the, the wrestling of the 80s, all of the bodybuilders and the giant dudes mm-hmm. and everything had to be larger than life. It wasn't just a wrestling thing. It was like an 80s thing. Everybody, big, strong, all the way up through the 90s, the Baywatch and everything like that. I mean, Pumping Iron was very influ- influential to these people. And Warrior sitting there, or they're talking about how Warrior would have all these pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he would just stare at these photos as he lifted weights. And it was the same story as every kid that ever got into lifting weights. He was a skinny guy, and he didn't have a lot of confidence, and he looked at the weight room and lifting weights and getting big as a way to compensate for these feelings of being small, which, in fact, is why I got into weightlifting, also because of The Ultimate Warrior. And shirts and skins basketball. Mm. But I felt for the guy. So he moves to California where he meets Sting. They talk about the Venice Beach bodybuilding scene where someone just says, steroids were part of the regimen of what you took to be a pro bodybuilder. Everyone says they were legal in the early 1980s, which I didn't know. It's mm-hmm. news to me. Well, they were, they were, uh, they were uh, more legal than they were at the end of the 80s. Yeah. They became, they became controlled substances in the late 80s, which they had not been before. I see. So there's a, we see an interviewer asking Warrior a question about steroids, and Warrior answers in a very honest but very angry manner. Like, he's upset he has to address this. And he tells a story about meeting an upper echelon bodybuilder who told him, once you get to the very, very peak of your uh, of your craft, that's when you need to answer that question. I was 295 pounds before I ever used steroids. He says that's the story, and make sure you get it right. Far be it for me to question the warrior, mm-hmm. but they had a lot of pictures of him early in his bodybuilding career. Yes, and uh, he, I find it hard to believe that he was 290 pounds before he ever touched a steroid. The the, the positive is he at least admits in this quote, that he had used steroids, but it is your typical bodybuilder deal where, as a bodybuilder, this guy didn't want you to think that the only reason that he looked great was because he took steroids. So he has to tell the story that, well, I was 290 pounds of solid muscle, then I started using steroids. That way you don't question whether he would have been big without steroids. Now I'm playing Sam Roberts, psychologically evaluating these guys. It's party time on the program today. I got our main man, Filthy Tom Lawler, here. We're going to have a celebration for you for your for your epic victory here. Please sit down, Tom. What's going on? You are talking to the champ, baby. Yeah? The new Japan strongest. I got balloons for oh, you. Oh, yeah. Yes. There were no balloons. It said, congratulations, new 
New Japan Strong Openweight Champion. So instead I got thinking of you and a cat. We're not going to be drinking here on Twitch. We're only going to have a shot. That doesn't count as drinking. The finest. The finest absinthe. A Brian size Diet Coke. Look at this thing. Yeah, this is this is a big one. Probably a little bit too big, but you know what? Let's do this. One, two, three. Ooh, man. Oh. The greatest mixed martial artist slash wrestler in figure four history, Thomas Lawler, the greatest Taurus that has ever been a champion professional wrestler. The greatest Taurus? You know what I always do when we're done with calls? I hit this button. You know what it says? It says this. We are sorry, but the show has ended. Goodbye. This right here, my friend, this is Mini Zazu. He is the new show mascot. He's going to be sitting here. He's so proud of you for what you did over that weekend, Tom. Congratulations, Tom. Thanks, man. That's right. No tears on this show, Tom. Come on, buddy. There, Hold it together. Joy. You did a there, great job. Joy. We're all proud of you here. If you enjoy these videos, for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full-length editions of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.